Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. everyone, welcome back to another installment of Talking Tudors. I'm your host, Natalie Grunigar. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'd like to start by thanking the sponsor of today's episode, Sandra Bird, author of the Tudor Ladies in Waiting series. A rich alchemy of fact and fiction, these critically acclaimed books chronicle the glittering court lives of three queens and their closest friends and companions. The novels brim with heartwarming and heartbreaking circumstances and heroines who choose lives worth risking all. Book one, To Die For, follows Queen Anne Boleyn through the viewpoint of Margaret Wyatt. Library Journal awarded it a Best Books of the Year pick and said the novel brings history to life in exquisite detail. Book two, The Secret Keeper, uncovers love and betrayal in the life of Queen Catherine Parr. Library Journal calls this book atmospheric, full of twists, and a must-read for Tudor fiction fans. Finally, book three, Roses Have Thorns, draws close to Queen Elizabeth I through Ellen von Snakenborg, who transformed into Helena, the Marchioness of Northampton. I loved all three of these books and found this concluding book masterful, impeccably researched, and deliciously detailed storytelling. The series is available at Amazon.com. I would also like to acknowledge and thank the wonderful listeners who continue to support Talking Tudors on Patreon and extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone who's taken the time to rate and review the show. If you love the podcast and you never miss an episode, I invite you to join the Talking Tudors patron family. Please visit patreon.com slash talking tutors for more information. Join the Talking Tudors patron family to instantly unlock access to 126 exclusive posts, including 22 audio releases and 30 videos. Patrons are also eligible to attend additional monthly live talks and to enter patron-only monthly giveaways. May's prize is a copy of Tudor Mystery, The Master of the Countess of Warwick, published to accompany the exhibition Tudor Mystery, A Master Painter Revealed. The lucky winner will also receive a portrait miniature of Thomas Nivett. You can also support the podcast and share your love of Tudor history with the world by buying Talking Tudors merchandise. There are a number of designs and products available, including phone cases, mugs, notebooks and apparel. Check out all the products at talkingtudors.threadless.com. I would love to see pics of you wearing or using your Talking Tudors merch, so please do tag me on social media and use the hashtag #ILoveTalkingTudors. Now, on to today's episode. My wonderful friend, Dr. Owen Emerson, and I have teamed up yet again to answer all your burning questions about Anne Boleyn's downfall. Please note that this is the second of two installments, so if you've not yet listened to part one, episode 201, I recommend you do that before listening to this particular episode. We pick up the conversation where we left off in the previous installment. So there is a question here that says, do you think Anne repented of her bad behavior? But then the commenter has put in place here, not that she was guilty, but she was a bit haughty and reckless, perhaps. Or was she just so shocked she thought he'd pardon her up until that last moment? I do think there's a sort of repentance going on. We can see that at her trial, actually. We can see her talking about not having always been as humble as she might have been. And that's probably a, a good bit of self-reflection from yeah, Anne there I think in it that is. moment. <laughs> uh, I think we can agree that she wasn't necessarily as humble um, as Henry wanted her to be, certainly. And she does talk about having not sinned in any other way, which I think is really important for her to convey that, yes, I was not, I was not the model queen. Uh, I could have done things differently. And she does also speak of jealous uh, fancies that she's had, which perhaps she 
didn't have to <laughs> confess because he wasn't particularly faithful to her. Let's not forget that he did uh, stray during their relationship. But yes, I, I think she is reflecting on her behaviour. I think we can see that throughout her conversations that are recorded. Um, was it this? Was it that? Was yeah. it this conversation? Yeah. This is a massive period of reflection, not just because she wants to know why she's there, but actually if she has done anything that makes her culpable. And although, the, the, you know, I, I think the kernel of information that came from her admission that she'd had this conversation about looking for dead men's shoes, that isn't in the indictment. It's really important to note that. I think her talking about it gave Cromwell the kernel of information that he needed. Now, he didn't want to specify what it was because it obviously was not talking about the king's death although she was, by implication, talking about his yes, death. Yeah. And to be honest, it would have looked like a really puny thing to bring up as a admission. But I think it sort of gave him the final conclusion that he needed, because he wasn't looking for Anne to go into a nunnery. Uh, Henry certainly wasn't after that. He needed her dead, and he wanted her dead, he did not need another Catherine of Aragon on his hands. No. <laughs> and unfortunately, she would have been safer if Catherine had still been alive. Absolutely. That is, yeah, no question about that. But isn't it interesting how their, their lives were so connected in the end? I think it's, it's quite amazing. So. Quite amazing. I think this is at the heart of what we tried to do with our, our most recent exhibition, which is still on, is that their lives were completely intertwined and their fates were mm. completely intertwined as well. I think Catherine and Anne really did share more in common than divided them. And actually, I think it is time to reappraise their relationship and their qualities because they weren't so distinct from one another. And I think in an alternate universe they would have got on famously. Can you imagine the debates on religion that they could yeah. have had? And, you know, because Anne was just as learned in the traditional faith as she was uh, with reformist ideas. She had to be. That's one alternate universe that I would love to see is Me. no Henry. No Henry. And, <laughs> and what, kind, what kind of relationship Catherine and Anne would have had? Um, because they, they had so much in common. They really, really did. Indeed. So... Do you think much credence was given at the time to Anne's final confession to Cranmer, i.e. that she was innocent? Surely she would have not lied and damned her soul just before going to her death. Yeah, that's so interesting. So, yeah, I don't think she lied and went to her death with a lie on her lips at all. And I think I don't we don't know exactly what she confessed to Cranmer, but what we do know, and what we do have a record of, is her affirming her innocence on the Holy Sacrament and inviting Kingston to watch her do this and take mass with her. This was like the equivalent of a lie detector test in modern day terms, you know. I think it would have been very clear to anybody that witnessed that and anybody who heard about this, and this does get out really quickly. So somebody inside the tower, somebody close to Anne is spying for Shipweek because he's getting inside information, which is accurate because it, it, you know, it's the same as what Kingston's reporting. So I suggest that it may have been, and I think there's a question coming up about the women who served Anne, but we know four of the women, well, we know three definitely, and one is a bit iffy, but, um, but we know there were two other unnamed women that were also there. We don't know who these women were. They were kind of like extra servants. Possibly one of those could have been Chapuis informants. We don't know. But there would have been lots of people that saw Anne, you know, in this in these very, very private moments, swearing and affirming her innocence that she never, you know, she had not committed adultery with anybody or any of these other charges. And I think, yes, that was very important to Tudor people. I think they would have understood that she was, in fact, innocent because, as this person has said, you would damn your soul if you lie at that particular moment. And we know she took mass just hours before she was executed. So, you know, I think this is real evidence of the fact that, and we sort of know it anyway, but that she was absolutely innocent of those particular charges laid against her. Not to say she's a saint. I don't want, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, paint a picture of someone that is a saint that does no wrong. This is not the end that we know. Anne had her faults and she... I think, as you've said, reflected on those in the end and realised that perhaps, yes, she wasn't as humble. She didn't show the humility she might have. And there are 
a couple of other um, accusations made against them that Chapuis mentions, for example, that Anne and George laughed at Henry's songs, that they laughed at the way he dressed, at the ballads he made. So you can see that they're capable of cruelty. They they are. And I'm quite happy to admit that. You know, she wasn't a saint, but she was certainly innocent of those charges, I think. And if I was a, a gambling lady, Owen, I would bet a, quite a lot on the fact that she was innocent. And I think her, you know, hearing mass and affirming her innocence on the Holy Sacrament would have just been very convincing to anybody at that time. I completely agree with your answer. I think it would have been incredibly compelling. And actually, I think I think perhaps it helps to explain quite how sympathetic Chapuis becomes yes. towards her, not only because of what he hears of what happened at the trial, but getting this, you know, really important piece of information. And then, of course, on the scaffold itself and does, you know, what she is supposed to do, save for admit her guilt. And again, this, you know, it doesn't look particularly impressive from today's perspective, but there was a formula to these speeches. They were fairly rigid. I mean, if you if you read scaffold speeches, they're sort of set in a way. Of course, there are there are differences. There are differences. But even when you you hear George's, which is a much longer scaffold speech, there are elements of that which sound almost identical to Anne's and because there is this formulaic way that they are structured I guess but that omission would have rung very loudly in the ears of the spectators and coupled with this information that she's not just refusing to admit guilt but she's confessing none you know that she's innocent I mean my goodness you can really get to to understand why there is this wave of sympathy from people who you'd least expect it from it's um really really fascinating yeah I think it's quite compelling evidence isn't it and I think yeah, the other thing that neither George or Anne say is that they deserve the punishment, you know, because they're obviously implying there's been no crime committed. So it's it's very, yeah, it's so interesting. So, oh, here we go. Here's the question about the women. So who were the women with Anne at her execution and who helped her, for example, remove the headdress, the jewels and the expensive outer dress? And then just a point about the dress covered with blood, would that then pass on to somebody else after that? Or is that um, thrown away, I suppose? So there's been a lot of confusion over who attended Anne on the scaffold. And I think a lot of the confusion comes from an eyewitness who says that they are young women. However, I don't think that we have any other information which suggests that they were any different to the women who have been attending upon her. So I think it's a bit of a leap to suggest that we could have any idea you know we don't for example have anyone saying lady kingston did this or you know we just don't have that level of information so while it's not sort of clear cut i don't think we have enough information to say that Anne was allowed different women uh already confirmed that they were the women who were charged to look after her we just don't have that level of information so I think without that kind of information it's probably safer to assume that she was attended by the women who were in attendance with her uh, in the tower there are a lot of people that that witness this yes therefore therefore the spectator might not have been that close to them let's let's put it like that I mean I think perhaps definitely about a thousand people maybe even more maybe double that so all of the observers aren't going to be seeing these yeah. women up close. So I, I don't necessarily think that that comment solidifies this idea. It's also rooted in information which isn't accurate about books that are given to specific yes. women. This is another issue. So I think it's George Wyatt that talks about a book being given to his sister uh, on the scaffold. And that legend has actually been attached, to my knowledge, to three different books of hours, yes. including the book of hours that was held, uh, that is held, sorry, at Hever Castle, um, the 1527 book of hours by Germain Hardouin, uh, which has been brilliantly studied by my wonderful colleague, uh, the historian Kate McCaffrey. Now, Kate has brilliantly exposed that it can't be this book. And we know that because in 1956, I think it was, no, sorry, 1946, Heaver actually had a Psalter which belonged to Anne Boleyn. It's not the Psalter that's in the British 
library that Asta detailed that that was the sorter in his inventories that Anne took to the <laughs> scaffold. And after this sorter was stolen from Heaver, very tragically, that little legend just happened to be transferred onto uh, the 1527 Book of Hours. So these little nuggets of information are very problematic. So I'm very wary of any of them, to be honest. I think they come from a good place almost yes. because uh, everyone wants everyone wants a relic almost fits into that tradition but I think they're highly problematic. With regards to the clothes that Anne was wearing, we actually have quite a good idea of what she was wearing. She was wearing a bonnet and frontlet, that's a, a gable hood. She was wearing a gown of grey damask and yep. a crimson kirtle, and she had an ermine mantle, that's sort of like a cape. It was May, it was very early in the morning, so I should think it would have been quite chilly, a bit dewy. Yeah. And actually, there is a precedent that executioners essentially have to undress the corpse. And therefore, as part of their perks, they keep the clothing, the apparel that um, the individual was wearing. Henry actually pays for those clothes. He actually pays the executioner to get those clothes back. And it's not cheap either. Um, he pays quite a lot of money for them. Now, whether or not they were worn again uh i should think the ermine mantle was and i should think the ermine mantle probably had been catherine's because furs were very much uh, a matter of debate as to catherine keeping furs and uh them returning so i i shouldn't think the ermine mantle was bloodied any any way the hood i should think wasn't either it might well have appeared on jane's head we we can't rule that out horrible to think of though it is mm. We, we certainly know that the, the queens wore each other's jewels. And I think we've got pretty good evidence as well. If the Nid Hall portrait, for example, is Anne Boleyn, and I think there's good reason to believe that it is. Very much looking forward to talking more about that when our new exhibition comes out. I think it's quite evident that she's wearing the hood that Jane Seymour can be seen wearing in the Whitehall mural. Um, so we do have good evidence that there was a royal wardrobe, which we know there was, and that items, garments would be reused between the queens. I should think the gown was probably not wearable, but that's not to say that parts of it weren't repurposed. We don't have evidence of that, but thinking laterally, as it were, it's not impossible that, um, you know, material was seriously expensive stuff. Yeah. Dyeing material was an incredibly difficult process very complex one. It was probably damask that she was wearing. So it's not inconceivable that it was repurposed in certain ways or segments of it was. The other possibility is that the jewels were stripped from the gown, uh, from the kirtle, and they were destroyed. That's my best yes. answer for that one. Thank you. Um, I was also just thinking that although we don't have a record of obviously who exactly was on the scaffold with Anne, it just popped into my head that we do have a record of who, who attended her at her trial. So that was Lady yes. Kingston and Lady Boleyn. So I would suggest that it would have been the two of them on the scaffold as well. Perhaps maybe because of their closeness to her or their seniority as the wife of William Kingston. I don't know. But but they were definitely the two that were at the trial. So whether they allowed all four of the women that were attending her on the scaffold, we don't. We simply don't know. But I agree with you. I think they were definitely the same women that you know served her from the very beginning. I don't think she was permitted women from her privy chamber. I know we want her to have had someone close there with her at that particular point, but we just, we don't have evidence of that, do we? We don't. And, you know, quite often I see, especially on social media, the idea that Catherine Carey was on the yeah. scaffold yeah. Um, with Anne. Scaffolds were really small things. They were high. And I think yeah. actually Henry specifies that Anne's is to be a certain height. He does. Um, because yeah. he wants... Um, people to witness it. Justice had to be seen to be done. And um, that's the whole point of a scaffold is so that people can see uh, what is happening. You know, they don't have a, a, a massive amount of space. Yeah. So you, you could probably fit on the scaffold safely. And I, I'm i talking particularly here about uh, the logistics of the beheading by a sword. An axe necessarily goes up and down. So it's not going to be of any risk to mm -hmm. anyone else on the scaffold. But a sword, you have to swing around you. So you're not going to have a massive amount of people on the scaffold itself. Anne probably would have felt very much alone 
as her ladies left her after having attended her, her, her dress and her hair. So yes, there increasingly seems to be a drive to identify these women and add more. I just don't think there's evidence for it, unfortunately. So next question, Natalie. Why death? What was Anne actually found guilty of? Such a good question. It's funny. We've told this story so many times and there's still confusion about this. And, and I understand why, because we, we hear so many different things on social media or fiction. So why death is a really good question. And, and Owen, oh, and my understanding, and you can jump in at any point, is that the only crime that Anne was accused of that at this point in time was actually punishable by death was the charge of treason, the charge of conspiring to kill Henry, which she's in fact charged with. So she is charged and found guilty of adultery with obviously five men, incest with her brother George Berlin and conspiring the king's death, which is essentially a charge of high treason. And that is the only charge that I can see here that is is in fact punishable by death and the, the common punishment for men, of course, was hanging, drawing and quartering, unless you were a member of the nobility or aristocracy, in which case it was beheading, or if the king commuted your sentence like he does for Mark Smeaton. So Mark Smeaton should have been hung, drawn and quartered. But of course, remember, Mark Smeaton is the only one that confesses to adultery with Anne. He pleads not guilty to treason and conspiring the king's death, but he pleads guilty to adultery with Anne. And it's quite obvious that the poor man has been, you know, coerced into this and you can just imagine sitting in front of Thomas Cromwell and Thomas Cromwell saying that you're going to be hung, drawn and quartered. It's a terrible situation. So Anne is accused of conspiring the king's death. On the actual indictment appear other details. There's there's quite a bit of detail, quite a lot of very vivid detail about, you know, yeah. her putting her tongue in George's mouth, George's putting his tongue in her mouth. So all these kind of details to try and paint this awful picture of these, these people. And she's also accused of and found guilty of giving gifts of money to the men, which she admits herself she did because it was New Year's Eve. That There's so many ridiculous aspects to this case, like farcical aspects. But I think the, the main charges of adultery, incest and conspiring the king's death, she was found guilty of all those things. She was accused and found guilty of trying to plot the king's death. And when you look at the specific kind of, they do give some dates but they put this sort of catch-all phrase after everything, which is, and Diver's Day before and after. So this happened at Hampton Court and Diver's Day before and after. So there's no way of challenging these charges. It's it's kind of impossible. So the offences were supposed to have happened over a 27-month period. They happened at um, Hampton Court, Westminster, Eltham. So all different locations. And it kind of says when when she was here on this date, you know, she... She and there's always first she lures them and then she then she sleeps with them. So there's always this sort of two part to the to these um, accusations. And she is found guilty of all these charges. Twenty six jurors find her guilty of all of these charges. And um, there is also a suggestion that I think comes from Shapui. I mentioned he says that they were also charged with laughing at the king. I don't think, from memory, I don't think that appears on the actual indictment, but that is something Shapui reports. And there is also a suggestion that she has been charged with poisoning Catherine of Aragon and planning to poison Mary, but I also don't think this is in the official document, so I'm not completely sure about that. But um, definitely the laughing at the King's Ballad and whatnot doesn't appear on the indictment. So the mate, she dies because of the treason charge, so that's why that was so crucial to the Crown's case, you know, that she... She had to, without that, it would have been pretty flimsy and difficult to execute six people, on, you know, without that particular. Um, they go into quite a lot of detail about how they all met in order to conspire and to plot Henry's death and, and this sort of stuff. So, but yeah, it's definitely the, the charge of treason that is punishable by death. And when her uncle pronounces the, the punishment that she's to be burned or beheaded at the king's pleasure, Henry decides that um, moved by pity, of course, he's going to allow her to be beheaded because he doesn't want her burnt. So, yeah, I I think that's the perfect answer. I think there's the there's the broader question of why you know why is she yes. <laughs> why does she need to die? And I think it's because she's Anne Boleyn. He could not risk, as I said before, having another Catherine of Aragon on his hands, and he knows that he that she is just as intransigent as capable uh, as Catherine. But sadly for Anne, she has none of the protection that Catherine no. did. 
Um, she has none of the support of the people. She has no support abroad. As much as she has tried to engender the, the same kind of loyalty from France that Catherine enjoyed from her uh, native land, Anne is not protected by anyone. In fact, pro- perhaps her biggest sort of ally, her her protector is George, and that's why he has to go. So yes, death is an inevitability at this point um, because Henry wants her dead. I spent so long looking at this period and, and wrote an entire book on why death in that sense that you're that you're discussing now. And and I think it was kind of heartbreaking in the end to realize that Anne died because Henry wanted her dead. That was kind of like a real shock in a way. But yeah. but I think also as I and I go into a lot more detail in the in my book, but I think Henry, although he knew she was, I, I personally believe that Henry knew she was not guilty of any of those charges that I've just mentioned. However, that's not to say that I don't think he felt she deserved the punishment. I think he felt betrayed by her in other ways. And, you know, and he was very injured by things she'd done. And, and there's a whole, you know, you sort of have to get into Henry's head to understand how we came to this. But in the end, the bottom line is she died because Henry wanted her dead. You're right. I, I totally agree with that. But it's sort of like hard to kind of admit to yourself in a way because we still, part of us still wants this to be a love story, don't we? And it's like, how can that be a love story if it ends like that? Oh, this is an interesting question. So had Catherine of Aragon not died in the beginning of January that, that year, so 1536, and everything else happened as it did, so Henry has his jousting accident and has her miscarriage, Henry still, you know, shows an interest in Jane Seymour, do you think Anne's fate would have been different? Yeah, I do. I don't think he could risk getting rid of Anne whilst he had another wife and another queen alive because it would have reignited and reopened that can of worms i mean that can of worms is still open there are many people who do not recognize anna's queen and who recognize the legitimacy of mary and catherine and it it would have created a constitutional nightmare so in a really strange twist of fate Catherine is as much Anne's protector as Anne has been her tormentor. Yeah, I think things would have played out very, very differently indeed. And I don't even know that Henry would have sought a separation or anything like that. I don't think he could. I don't. I think it was a matter of pride for him at this point that he was right, that Catherine, in his eyes, was never his true queen or wife, and that he was now an emperor, that he was now the head of his Catholic church in England and that the Pope did not have um, authority over him. And I don't think he would have risked his subjects questioning that again. So, yes, I think Catherine's death played a massive role in the outcome of May 1536, yeah. Yeah, I, look, I completely agree with you. I think that opened up avenues that were just impossible beforehand. And Henry, as I mentioned before, was incapable of admitting mistakes. So there was, no, I've ne- he's never done it throughout his whole reign. Said, "Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, I'm wrong." And in this particular case, where he'd fought so hard, where he'd literally turned heaven and earth upside down to have Anne to then annul the marriage for any other reason would have been seen like an acknowledgement of the Pope's authority. And there was no way that yeah. he could do that or that he was going to do that. And it's like saying, oh, yeah, Catherine, you were correct. Oh, Charles, yeah, you were right too. And the Pope, I shouldn't have married Anne. You know, I was wrong. There's no way he would have done that. So I think you're right. Catherine was her safety net. And once that was pulled out from beneath her, she was just so vulnerable and just so open to everything that we saw that happened. So I think that was a, a really great question really is. Another question. Do we know how Anne's mother dealt with the shock of losing two beloved children and, and I quote, a shallow husband that did nothing, end quote? Oh, this is so difficult. I find it really difficult because I have a son and a daughter and I always just put, like, it's difficult to imagine, but you can sort of get an inkling of what it would have been like. I think we don't know for certain. There's no record, you know, that records exactly what Elizabeth Boleyn felt or what she said, or anything like that. Unfortunately, we don't have that sort of information. But I think, again, knowing the family, knowing how close-knit they were, knowing that Anne was so concerned with her mother's well-being and her health when she was in the tower, and that is recorded, gosh, I think she would have been absolutely devastated. And I think, although it's difficult to put yourself into those shoes if you haven't been in that situation, I think we can all imagine the utter grief. And I suppose 
not just because they've both died, but because of the manner in which they've died and the injustice surrounding it. And also you were unable to do anything to help them. I think that must have been like an incredible torture. So as far as we know, Thomas and Elizabeth left when they realized there was nothing else they could do. Thomas was not at the trial, as is often reported. And I think they would have gone back to Hever Castle to mourn privately the loss of their children, to surround themselves with family and people that cared about them. You know, it would have been really, really difficult, I think. And I think the privacy and the haven of Heber, we often see the Berlin's return there when there's turmoil. And when they do yeah. want to have a little bit more private uh, privacy, it's a very um, intimate space. You know, if you visited Heber, it's not a humongous castle, not a Hampton Court. You know, it's it's very intimate. It's a lovely family space. And I think that would have been where they wanted to be, like in a little sort of cocoon, cocooned away from court and from London and from all the accusations and the rumors that were swelling around their children. How she dealt with it, I don't know that, you know, like you mentioned on earlier, within what, two years, Elizabeth is dead. Within three, Thomas is dead as well. So I think, although we know she was a little, she was unwell, her health wasn't she wasn't that robust at that point. This must have just been, just destroyed her, I think. And in terms of Thomas, a shallow husband, I can understand why this person has said that because there's part of me that, that wishes that he could have done more. However, knowing the Tudor court as we do, knowing Henry, knowing how access was restricted to Henry by Cromwell and others, there was actually nothing Thomas could do, unfortunately. So the pain of that inability to help must have really eaten away at them, I think. And um, yes, he returns to court. But as you've said, he's a changed man. He's different in his correspondence. He returns to court because he's ordered to return to court for certain events that are at court. And I think that must have been extremely difficult for him to have to see the man who ordered the execution of your two children, children who you not only have you loved them, but you've invested so much time and energy in them. You know, you've watched them grow up. You've watched, they are incredible. They're not your sort of average wallflowers, are they? They they would have left such a huge hole at court, I think, and in that Berlin family. I think, I think they kind of haunt, they kind of haunt the court, don't they? Yes, uh, That they absence do. sort of haunts yeah. it. And I don't think it's ever really the same again at Henry's court after what happened. Mm -hmm. Certainly in terms of the fear that must have been present because the moment that that sword swung, no one was safe. No one. That's not so even true. the queens, not even yeah. the queens were safe anymore. You know, it set the most horrific precedent and one that happens again. I, I do think it irrevocably changes the game. Mm -hmm. And of course it sets another precedent because it's not just consorts that have to be worried. You know, it, it's almost the the final step towards what happens with Charles I and his execution, which would previously, I think, have been just as unthinkable. So I do think that we sort of encourage to judge Thomas in this moment, but it, it, you're so right, he, he really can do nothing and nor can anyone else. No one else is uh, acting for Anne. No one else is acting for any of those for, for a good reason. If a, a king arrests his queen, no one could do anything. No. Who can do anything? So it's very easy to judge a father. Very interestingly, we don't judge Elizabeth. We don't say, why didn't she go and save her daughter? It's a very strange... Yeah, um, that is true. You know, we, 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 why don't we burden Mary Boleyn? Why don't we ask why she didn't save George? The reality is that these people could do nothing for their loved ones. They, they simply couldn't. And I would say that's even more the case when it's the Queen of England who's being subjected to this horrific act. Yes, I, I think it did break the Boleyns. There, there have been questions about whether Elizabeth and, and Thomas even maintained a relationship after this point. Uh, I think they did. Um, I don't think there's any real evidence to suggest they didn't. Of course, Elizabeth dies in London and is therefore buried at Lambeth uh, in the Howard family plot there. So I think that's probably where that assumption yes, comes yeah, from. I think so. But actually, actually, it was entirely conventional to be buried close to where you died. 
died. She just happened to be in the capital when she when she died. Um, so I don't know that we can read too much into that. I think the fee that you mentioned is really, really interesting because not only, of course, is Anne Queen and Henry's consort, but she's sort of imbued with this extra divinity, isn't she? Because she's anointed. She's actually anointed at her coronation and, you know, crowned with the crown of St. Edward the Confessor. So it's almost like she should have had this extra layer of protection and she doesn't yeah. really disregards that completely when he has her executed. So I think you're so right that everyone else from that point on would have been just so careful of what they were saying. And of course, we see it happen again. People forget in the end, don't they? But the the hole that must have been left, not just by Anne and George, but of course, let's remember, you know, Sir Henry Norris, older than yeah. Henry, been at court his pretty much his whole life. You know, William yeah. Brereton, uh, Mark Smeaton. So those men as well, all members of the, yeah. you know, the Privy Chamber, men that were well yeah. liked and suddenly all gone, you know, within, yeah. oh, goodness, what, 19 days from, you know, first arrest to Anne's execution. So it, it's a shocking event and it's difficult to kind of convey how shocking it must have been for people at that at that point as well. I think actually it's why the Tudors isn't the same <laughs> does that make sense <laughs> yeah, the actual tune is the show after after <laughs> Anne's gone it's not quite the same and I don't know if that's just because I'm like massively biased <laughs> but I always remember when I finished reading Bring Out the Bodies I couldn't wait to get The Mirror and the Light I'm talking about Hilary Mantel's amazing trilogy and I kept thinking to myself but there's going to be no Anne <laughs> and there's going to be no you know there's no more and there's no the court is sort of stripped of these is, yeah. amazing characters so it would have been a very different place you know it really would have with a unprecedented fear I should imagine and trepidation and caution so this is a good question so after her execution after Anne's execution when was the last mention of her in the sort of court documents ambassador reports and how long after the execution did people stop mentioning her or reporting what had happened this is really interesting because you'd think that people just stop talking but of course there's there's a bureaucratic element to this as well isn't there because whenever you know they they're talking about the finances of the queen's household yes. yeah. she has debts that have to be settled so from from a documentation point of view she had probably more longevity than in everyday parlance if that makes sense like yeah. I doubt many people would have been talking openly in front yeah. of the king about her but from a official perspective there were a lot of loose ends to tie up so she does appear very interestingly also as the late queen which you wouldn't think um, would be the title afforded to her so yes there are throughout the if you know if you go through letters and papers there are there are several references to her uh, fairly frequently after her death and then increasingly less so I w would imagine but of course she's she's sort of in the fabric of the building still we have this idea that Henry completely obliterates her from you know mind and physical sort of representation but yeah. that that just isn't the case as can be you know clearly seen in the eaves of that beautiful great hall at Hampton Court her falcons are still there they were just painted out um in a in a dark color also I'm thinking about Henry's inventory there are many references to Anne yes. in object form her initials are still in the coffers of jewels and in carpet form and in you know many many different forms so although Anne is gone she's still sort of there in a way yeah. and you know there are references to her I should think that anyone who possessed a portrait of Anne would have probably taken it down at this stage but there is this assumption that all of them were destroyed and we just don't have evidence of that no. unfortunately Henry certainly does not order that her portraits are destroyed. So of the many panel portraits of Anne that survive, very few of them have been tested. So it, it's not impossible that one of them might be much closer to, if not from Anne's lifetime. That's another little project that we have in the works. Yes. So more references than you would think is yeah. my answer yeah and i think the 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 1547 inventory so an inventory that was done after henry's death within kind of like six months of his death that recorded all these movable stuff and i think there's okay. something like 
in excess of 17,000 entries. You can actually purchase yourself a copy, everyone. I love mine, just, you know, amazing through it. And Anne does turn up quite a number of times. And interestingly, like Owen said, she's referred to as the late queen, which is really interesting. Yeah. Anne of Cleves, by the way, still alive at this point. So we're not talking about Anne of Cleves and she wouldn't have been yeah. referred to as the late queen anyway. But um, so this is definitely Anne Boleyn. And even though the marriage was annulled and she was executed, she's still the late queen. So it's quite interesting. And then, of course, in Elizabeth's reign, we get people are talking about her again and they're trying to curry favor with Elizabeth by, you know, talking about her mum. So such an interesting question. Uh, did Anne leave anything behind for Elizabeth? Are any of her possessions or jewellery... Uh, were these taken away from her after she was sent to the tower? Again, I think this is a question people ask a lot. And I know quite a few people asked about this. So again, no specific record of Anne leaving anything for Elizabeth. But like we've just been discussing, it's not impossible that somebody at court kept something of Anne's and then would pass it on to Elizabeth. I think that's really possible. We do have that wonderful portrait that is hanging at Hampton Court. Uh, the family of Henry VIII, fantastic portrait, and both Mary and Elizabeth are depicted in this particular portrait. And Elizabeth appears to be, and I've looked at this so many times, wearing an A initial. It's strange because you think, why would Henry allow his daughter to wear an A initial, given that he'd executed her mother, Anne Boleyn? So, you know, there's sort of lots of discussion that has happened around this, but it does appear that she's wearing an A necklace, and it could be that that had once belonged to her mother. We don't know. So it's it's a lot of kind of guesswork, unfortunately, but it's not impossible. It's certainly not impossible that some of her jewellery could have ended up with Elizabeth, that a supporter of both Anne and then Elizabeth could have kept something safe. You know, we know from Kate McCaffrey's brilliant work that there were people that supported the Berlins, people in Kent that loved this family and that kept her book of hours safe throughout this very difficult time when Henry was still on the throne and, and then when Mary was on the throne. So I don't think it's a, a sort of too much of a stretch of the imagination to think that some other things would have been kept. And as we were talking earlier about the account that was given to Elizabeth about what happened, you know, with Anne and Henry, was she actively seeking information about her mother at that point? Perhaps, you know, at that point, people could have come forward with portraits or or whatnot. We know that she owned a ring that almost certainly has a portrait of Anne in it and that she honoured her mother in so many different ways, some more subtle than others, but she definitely loved and respected her mother and honoured her memory. So I like to think that she would have ended up with something of Anne's, but no actual official record of her leaving her anything, unfortunately. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I think... We don't have any information of Anne certainly gifting anything to Elizabeth. It's not beyond the realm of possibility, considering we know that she has spoken to Parker about looking after Elizabeth in some way, that she would have ensured that Elizabeth had something even before she's arrested. That's not out of the uh, question, but we can't prove it. That portrait that you talk of at Hampton Court, I think, is a really, really important one. And I'm reminded here to note the incredible work of Dr. Nicola Tallis, who is a complete expert on these jewels. There is something really interesting about that portrait because it doesn't appear that Henry VIII ordered it. We have no record of him commissioning it, but certainly we don't have any financial evidence that he did. So it could well be that this was a portrait commissioned by someone else or a, a, a painting with many portraits in it. And I thought recently about who that possibly could be, who during the period where Henry has just restored his daughters to the succession, but not legitimised them, you know, who is playing an active part in this? I think Catherine Parr could be a candidate here. Now, again, we don't have any evidence of this, but we know that Catherine Parr, was a keen supporter of artists. She commissioned at least 10 portraits, I think, of herself. So I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that she was responsible for creating this compromise painting, which recognises that his two daughters are in the fold again, but that they're not centrally so. And I was reminded about the presence of Jane Seymour. Now, would a courtier not include the current queen, but include a former queen? 
I think it might have been a bit of a faux pas. Yes. <laughs> but not for but not for Catherine Parr. You know, this could be a really clever way for Parr to be almost thanking Henry for restoring his daughters to the succession, but emphasizing that centrality of Edward and where he came from, from, from Jane, um, showing that close succession. Uh, that Henry wanted. And I think the jewellery, therefore, could act as a way of emphasising this, because not only is Elizabeth seen wearing the A pendant, but Mary is shown wearing a cross. Now, outwardly, this is entirely conventional for Mary to be wearing a cross, but we do know that Catherine of Aragon left her, or certainly wanted her to inherit a cross that had come with her from Spain. And I believe, and I need to read more into this, that there was a, a real struggle for Mary to, to actually get possession of this cross. So actually, it would make sense yeah. that both are wearing pieces of jewellery which emphasise their own status. Yes, they're back in the family. Yes, they're back in the succession. But those pieces of jewellery, rather than being, rather than something that Henry would be allowing, you know, why would he, why would he? Actually, it could be something that is used to emphasise where they came from to, to the viewer, that these are the daughters of Catherine of Aragon, who was then deemed not to be a queen, therefore the daughter illegitimate, and the same for uh, Elizabeth. So... I, I think there's more to more to be gleaned from that painting. And I don't necessarily think it had to have been Henry that ordered it. That's so interesting. I think, you know, next time at, you're at Hampton Court, everyone just have a good look because it's a magnificent yeah. painting. And um, Owen, oh, I have one more question for you. And if you have stuck with us up until this point, this is like one of those movie marathons that just keeps, <laughs> on, keeps on going. So thank you if you're still here with us. So the last question, I know this is something you love. Absolutely love. So what is the current thinking about portraits of Anne, especially the drawings, which we both love, in the Royal Collection by Holbein? And this person has suggested that perhaps the Wyatt coat of arms, one of the drawings on the back has some sort of scribbles and one of it, part of it is the Wyatt coat of arms, was maybe that was a subtle way of indicating who should receive it after Holbein's death. What do you think? Um, So I'll start with the last part. That's a really interesting prospect. I think, actually, it's probably just more likely that it was almost like a doodle. I don't necessarily think that it has to relate to the sitter in any way, particularly because it's on the reverse. And I'm not overly convinced that it was Holbein that did it. You have to remember that these sketches were never really meant to be seen by anyone else. They were just for Holbein's reference. And because, of course, very few of the portraits that he created would have been painted with the sitter present. The point was that Holbein would go and sketch very sparingly in many instances, but beautifully capturing their essence as it were and he would often partially fill in elements so for example the neckline jewels he would only start them um, and then of course would finish them in the the final painting so I don't necessarily think that these were ever sketches that were designed to be displayed uh, though of course they are now and in many ways I I often prefer the sketch to the, yes. or, or certainly I, I admire it as much as the, the They're final They're sort piece. of livelier. I find them livelier, the, the sketches. And something is yeah. lost when they're created, obviously, in the painting form. It's, it's really interesting. It is. And we do know that there are changes um, between the sketch and the final painting. Often, I think there has been influence between that sitting and, you know, you can see this uh, in a number of examples where the sitter is beautifully smiling in one example yeah. um, and there's a much sterner, sort of more serious final composition in oil. I'm reminded also of one where there is quite a hairy wart depicted yes, in the sketch, yes. but not in the final painting. So Holbein is capturing what he sees and then creating an, not really an idealised version, but certainly an edited version in the final painting that will be received either by the sitter themselves or by the person that has commissioned the painting. 
as to those two sketches, I think both are Anne. This doesn't align with current thought. People either switch like a pendulum between the Windsor portrait, which is the one where she's wearing a coif and a nightgown being Anne, and that meaning that the one held in the British Museum can't be. I actually don't think the sketches are irreconcilable at all. I think it's very likely that the one held in the British Museum was created before the Windsor one. I think we're looking at Anne Rochford and I think we're looking at Anne the Queen. One of the things that is often used to question whether it can be Anne is the perceived idea that there is blue in her eyes. Actually, upon close inspection of the sketch itself, I don't think there is any blue. I think it's simple hatching that you can see often in Holbein's works. Moreover, in Holbein's sketch of Lady Audley, she quite clearly appears to have brown eyes. In the finished miniature, she has blue eyes. So there are ways to explain Mm. why she might not be depicted with really dark eyes in this sketch. They, They aren't the final version. And if these were worked up into portraits, which they probably would have been, they might well have looked slightly different to the sketch that we see. So I'm looking forward to telling you more about why I think they're both Anne. We are in the midst of preparing a brand new exhibition on the very subject of Anne's likeness at Hever Castle. So I'm very excited about being able to contribute to that and hopefully to break a bit of new ground in terms of what Anne Boleyn actually looked like. We have very, very few references, contemporary references, as you well know, Natalie, to Anne's image, to her appearance. Um, we, we don't really know what her hair colour was, no. for example. It's, it's maddening, you know, all of these assumptions that we have. All of the portraits that might be 16th century have large variances in them to do with eye colour, I've been able to sort of sort them out into different patterns. Some of those patterns, I think, are closer to Anne than others, but I'm not ruling out at this point of the possibility of one of them or a few of them being from Anne's lifetime. So watch this space. There's going to be a lot of science involved uh, in the process, and I I don't think we can say with any certainty that no contemporary portraits of Anne survive. We certainly know that at least two do, if not more, with the Windsor and British Museum sketch. So Wonderful. How exciting. Well, I think that's a really good point there to bring this conversation to an end. I thank everyone that submitted questions. I've had such a fantastic time chatting with Owen about these, and I hope we've been able to answer some of the things that you've asked. I apologize if we didn't get to your question. Like I said, this has been like a movie marathon. So I think, you know, (laughs) we'll leave the other questions for another time. But if you are watching this on YouTube, please feel free to pop your questions below and we'll see if we can get to them if we haven't answered them. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Owen, for another absolutely brilliant conversation. And I look forward very much to talking to you again very soon. You are so welcome. Thank you. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners. So if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family. And don't forget to subscribe, rate and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind the scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. Mm-hmm.